Hey, morning, Harry. Good to see you. Where you been hiding? Oh, Harry. <laughs> He's been hiding. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, how many minutes? Okay. All right. Everyone ready? I'd like to call to order the Lewis County County Commissioner's business meeting of Monday, April 2nd, 2018. <laughs> there is a quorum with all three commissioners present. And I would like Larry Grove, our auditor, to lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America now we're moving to public comment we have no one that signed up any last minute all right I move to approve the notice item resolution 18-110, call for sealed bids for the Vader Enchanted Valley Water System Reservoir construction. Second. Mr. Martin. Good morning, Commissioners. Eric Martin, Director of Public Works, here to speak on uh, resolution 18-110, call for sealed bids for the Vader Enchanted Valley Water System Reservoir construction project. These bids will be due to the clerk of the board uh, by 11 a.m. Tuesday, April 24th, 2018. This is a project that's a long time coming. We've been um, planning this and working on it for several years now. Um, due to a gap in funding, we have postponed this one year, so we're building this um, this year as opposed to which was originally planned to be built last year. Um, it's a 250,000-gallon column-supported wheels welded steel water reservoir uh, with a raw water pump station um, and associated appurtenances. Um, this also includes 145 linear feet of 4-inch ductile iron water line, 210 feet of 10-inch ductile iron water, 140 linear feet of 3-inch pipe, um, including all of the contract plans, provisions, and standard specifications. So the plan is to go out to bid, get under construction here in a month or so, and have the tank up and painted before the rains come in the fall. That's, that's the plan as of today. So any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Eric. It's been moved and seconded to approve resolution 18-110 for sealed bids for the Vader Enchanted Valley Water System Reservoir construction. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> motion carried. Okay, I make a motion to approve two consent items. That's the approval of the minutes for March 26, 2018, and then resolution 18-111. That's the approval of warrants. Second. Ms. Smith. Good morning, Commissioner. Suzette Smith, Chief Accountant, Auditor's Office, here to present to you resolution number 18-111. This is the weekly approval of claims against the various county departments. Last week, we issued 479 regular warrants. Those were 787, 788 through 788082, 788136 through 788237, and 788257 through 788338 for a total of $1,234,097.54. In addition, we note the following series as a skip in sequence. These warrants are issued on behalf of our special purpose districts and they are approved by their commissions. Those are numbered 788083 through 788135 and 788238 through 788256. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Suzette. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes and the resolution 18-111 of the consent agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Motion carried. I move to approve the deliberation items beginning with resolution 18-112 through resolution 18-118. Second. Mr. Smith. Good morning, Commissioners. Archie Smith with Lewis County Human Resources. I'm here to present, present resolution number 18-112, and this approves an hourly rate increase for the district court commissioner. 
Um, basically, the uh, district court judges presented to the Board of County Commissioners uh, inc a request to increase the rate of the district court commissioner. This is a part-time position that is not put in a bunch of hours, but the person has not had an adjustment since 2002 to that rate. That rate then was 50 or is $50 an hour, and it is requested to move that rate to 69.36 an hour, and that would be effective April 1st. Questions? Okay. Thank you. All right. Ms. York. Good morning, Danette York, Director of Public Health and Social Services. I'm speaking to resolution number 18-113. This is requesting to amend the policies and rules of the Veterans Relief Fund. The Veterans Advisory Board has recommended this one change. It is to change uh, language. Currently, the language says rental assistance and we would like to change it to housing assistance, which would allow more flexibility on what we could help a veteran with in the event that they are not actually renting a place but need some help in order to get in a place or keep their housing. Okay. Yeah. Allows more flexibility. Very good. Yes. yes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roy. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Martin Roy. I'm with the Real Estate Services, a portion of uh, Public Works. I'm here to speak to you on Resolution 14-114. This is a consent for a proposed uh, acquisition of additional right-of-way on Bunker Creek Road, Nadna. We have a, on Bunker Creek Road, northwest of Adna, requires a culvert replacement for fish passage at mile post 5.678. The project will require additional right-of-way and temporary easements from three property owners. The re this resolution instructs the county engineer to acquire the right-of-way from, from three property owners along the Bunker Creek Road for this project. Questions? Okay. Okay. I'm also here to speak on item 18-115, which is also a consent for a proposed acquisition right away for Pleasant Valley Road at mile post 2.179 in Napa Vine. This is also for a fish passage. The Pleasant Valley Road southwest of uh, Napa Vine requires a culvert replacement for fish passage. The project will require an additional right away from three property owners and a temporary easement for two, from two owners. This resolution instructs the county engineer to acquire the right-of-way for, for three property owners along Pleasant Valley Road for this project. Questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Martin. Good morning, again, Commissioners. Eric Martin, Director of Public Works. Here to speak to you to resolution 18-116, uh, adopt the Washington State Department of Transportation and American Public Works Association 2018 standard specifications for Lewis County um, and bridge construction contracts. So um, this is a standard adoption that we make every two years as WashDOT publishes their standard specifications. Um, so according to RCW 3686.030, um, roads and bridges amended from, uh, the standards for roads and bridges can be amended from time to time by the county legislative authority, and that's what we're doing here. Do you have any questions about that? So it's really RCW that changes and that it comes down to us to comply with what the RCW says? The, the RCW allows you to adopt these types of standards, and so that's the, you're, you're, you're right. using that right that you have here to adopt these standards. So, Eric, though, along with those standards, though, is there's obviously federal money and state money along with this. So if we do not adopt those particular standards, then we would technically not be eligible we, for We could be in danger of forfeiting yeah. definitely some really critical funding. So it's important that we do. They're also very, very functional for us. They work very well for us. Um, so, and we're, we're used to using this, these types of specifications. Most of our engineers are very familiar with them. So it's, it, it's, um, it's beneficial in many ways. It also offers us a lot of um, really good protection um, in our contracts as far as procedurally, if, um, if things do not go as planned, um, there's a lot of protections in those specifications that um, allow us to make sure that we um, are recouping costs if needed, so. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Eric. Mr. Skinner. 
Good morning, Commissioners. Steve Skinner with Lewis County Solid Waste, and I'm here speaking to a resolution 18-117. This resolution ratifies an interlocal agreement signed by the Lewis County Public Works Director and the Mayor of the City of Winlock for placement of a county-sponsored residential used waste oil collection system in the City of Winlock. Well, the, the City of Winlock has uh, asked us and desires to have one of these waste oil collection tanks and it's something that through ecology we come up with a couple years ago um, to prevent PCBs or polychlorinated biphenyl from transformers and things like that from entering the waste oil uh, collection system. So what these consist of, we have two separate tanks inside a 20 foot storage container that once one of the tanks are full we can lock that, test it with chlorine oil tests and then if, if it's okay, then we will pump that out and uh, sell the oil. And or if it is contaminated or the test results come back hot, then we have to dispose of it as, uh, it's actually a hazardous waste, but it's quite a process to get rid of it. So, so far we've been really good and haven't had any issues. So any questions? Thank you, sir. Right, thank you. Thank Register. you. Ms. Lester, Clerk of the Board, would you like to talk about the awarding of the county legal printing bid? Okay, Eric, thank you. Good morning, Eric Eisenberg from the Lewis County Prosecutor's Office. So normally the clerk would be finishing up what was started at the last hearing, but something a little bit out of the ordinary happened with the receipt of bids for the newspaper contract and so as the county's legal advisor I wanted to make a record of that. The process used in this case was the same used in any case to accept sealed bids. Uh, the specifications were published along with the location to which you were supposed to send your bid in a sealed envelope and the county received only two bids that actually met those requirements and those are the two bids that have been considered. But there was one asterisk, uh, which is that the county received an, a non-conforming bid from the town crier of Raymond. Uh, they accidentally had put the wrong address on the envelope and it had been sent to the clerk of court across the street as opposed to the clerk of the board in this building. Um, and as a result of that, the clerk, not knowing what it was, opened it up. And when the clerk realized, or the clerk's staff realized, that it wasn't for them, they packaged it up and they notified your clerk, um, who then could not actually accept that bid because it was addressed wrong and it wasn't sealed anymore. So she didn't look at it. She called and wrote to the town crier. So she talked to a real person and she sent them notice in writing indicating that uh, the that what looked like was supposed to be a bid had not come in correctly and invited them to use the time they had left because they had plenty of time left to resubmit the bid in a sealed envelope as it, they were instructed to do and we never heard back. So um, uh, given that notice and the fact that they didn't resubmit a bid and the fact that the, that the their attempt to submit a bid was unsuccessful, we had only two bids. Uh, the Chronicle was the low bidder it met all the specifications, and uh, so it's recommended that uh, the commissioners award the contract to the Chronicle. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank explanation. You. Any questions from the board? Okay. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent items or deliberation items, resolution 18 112 through 118. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Motion carried. Mm -hmm. Now we will be moving to the hearing section of our agenda. We will first have a staff report followed by a question and answer period. We will then close the question and answer period and open the hearing for formal testimony. And the formal testimony will be three minutes each. Anyone, any citizens out there, anyone else would like to testify should sign on the sheet next to Mr. Eisenberg to say that you would like to testify. So we could put it right there. Okay, let's begin with the staff report. Mr. Eisenberg. Thank you, Chair. So uh, I propose to stand here because then I can at least partially address the public as well. But when we get into questions, I'll move to the center 
um, to get out of the way of the public, unless okay. your honors have any problem with that. Um, so we're here today to discuss Resolution 18-119, which is the resolution by which the Board of County Commissioners would adopt the nomination procedure for freeholders. For those who don't know, uh, we received a petition uh, in accordance with the provision of the state constitution. The, a certain number of the voters are allowed to sign a petition uh, in Lewis County to place on the ballot a proposition of whether the county would like to have a board of freeholders impaneled uh, that would then draft a county charter, which would be like a constitution for, the, for Lewis County, a miniature constitution. The way that the constitutional provision reads is that if that petition is filed and it has enough signatures, and ours did, then uh, two different things go on the ballot. Question one, to the voters, would you like to have the Board of Freeholders begin work on drafting a charter? Question two, who would you like the freeholders to be, which is elections uh, for all of the various freeholders? If the proposition passed, yes, we wanted a Board of Freeholders, then those freeholders who won the elections would take office and they would begin the process of drafting a charter, which when it was finished being drafted, would be submitted again to the voters uh, for their decision on an up or down vote as to whether they would like it to take effect. At that same election, there also could be alternative charters proposed by the Lewis County Board of County Commissioners, and you can have more than one of those alternatives on the ballot. They're all there for a yes or no vote um, for the people. If uh, this, and that would be at a later election, not this November's election. If at this November's election, the, the people voted down the proposition as to whether they wanted to have a board of freeholders at all, then that's the end of the process. And those freeholders who won the election would have won an election, but would never take office. And that would be the end of their, of their official action. Where the Board of County Commissioner comes in at this point is that the Constitution requires the Board of County Commissioners to adopt a nomination procedure to facilitate that election of freeholders. Um, and so that is what is before the body today. Um, at the time that this hearing was scheduled and the first publication related to it, the Board of County Commissioners was considering uh, having a, an election by Board of County Commissioner uh, District at large. So there are three such districts in the county. They all have roughly equal populations. And the idea was that people would run at large in those districts and that five freeholders would come from each district uh, and people would be voting for their top five. The, that was not the commissioner's preferred method. Um, they preferred to have some method in which sub-districts could be used to assure more geographic diversity across all of Lewis County and also to provide for a more normal election where you vote for only one person instead of voting for five because that's not typical. Uh, in, in elections. Uh, at the time, we didn't have the data necessary to do the second option, but shortly afterwards we did, and so published uh, for this hearing is the one that the commissioners expressed more of an interest in, which is an alternative procedure. Um, for those of you who followed the materials that were available on the internet, it is shown in track changes to show how it's a change from the original proposal and there's also a clean copy of it, in case you want to see the clean copy. And of course, those things will be available after today as well. But the idea is that now the commissioners are working on what was sort of their preference originally. It is a sub-district election where each of the county commissioner's districts is divided into sub-districts. And that people who live in those sub-districts, they could run for freeholder from that area and their, their neighbors in that same sub-district would vote for them and whoever wins the election becomes a freeholder. There will be 15 freeholders in total. It's still the case that if you do the math out, five of them are coming from each of the commissioner districts, but they're now coming from 15 geographically distinct sub-districts that cover all of Lewis County. Each sub-district is equal in population to the greatest extent possible. Would you mind calling up the, um, the map of the proposed sub-districts, please? And you'll have to zoom out just a bit. So to help talk through what I'm talking about, 
And just so you know, if in case you're interested, there are two maps. Um, one map looks like this. It has the subdistricts shaded by color uh, because that's easier for some people to see each district uh, shown in its own color. There's another map uh, that has all of the voting precincts within each district labeled with a number and all the matching numbers are in the same district. So the numbers will be things like 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, and there will be It'll show you, so some people have an easier time matching the numbers than they have the colors. We have both available. But as you can see, if you would mind stopping for a sec. Um, the commissioner districts all are shown uh, with a thick line. I'm gonna have to stop talking while I gesture to the map for a second here. There's a thick line that divides Lewis County is three. Much of East County and some of South County is in District 3. You can see the label there. Then there's uh, much of West County is in District 2, and then a lot of the North and Northwest counties in District 1. Each of those districts has been divided into five subdistricts, which are shown by the shaded areas. Those subdistricts are all geographically continuous. You know, they're all together as one block. They all have roughly equal population and they are an attempt to um, sort of fairly reflect the diversity of Lewis County. The proposal before the commissioners today is going to basically work as follows. If you have been a resident of Lewis County for five years by the time of the election in November, and if you are over 18 and registered to vote in Lewis County, then you are eligible to run. It is not the case that you have to be a landowner. Some people, because of the term freeholder, that has some historical connotations which have been brought, about, uh, brought to our attention during the process. And I want to make sure everyone knows, being a freeholder does not mean that you have to own land. You may be a renter or any other type of resident. Nor does it mean that you have to admit any kind of racial, economic, or demographic description. Any person who resides in Lewis County is uh, who's over 18 and will have resided here for five years before the election is eligible to run for freeholder. It's designed to be a citizen panel. It's a citizen body like a constitutional convention. And so there's no qualifications other than those and your desire to help work on the process. So if you reside in, say, uh, the Silver Creek area, you would be in a particular subdistrict. You could uh, file for a freeholder from that subdistrict. You would then pretty much follow the process that almost all other candidates follow, um, with the exception that you would have to pay a filing fee of $50. That is the proposal. Um, that's more than some offices and much less than others. Um, you would then follow all the rules that regular candidates follow, in including working with the State Public Disclosure Commission, things of that nature. And you would be permitted to write a statement for the uh, online voters guide. Uh, you would be appear on the ballot like any other candidate in the subdistrict in which you're running and you would campaign in the same manner as other offices and if you win the election you could be the freeholder for your particular subdistrict. I think um, the procedure for those who wish to view it actually enumerates which voting precincts are in which subdistrict. So if you are having a hard time figuring out where your dis uh, district might be, I encourage you to look at your voting precincts. That information is uh, on your registration. It's also uh, probably available from the auditor's office. And, uh, and of course, you can make reference to the maps, which will be publicly available if you need to. If uh, the filing period will be the same filing period as for all other candidates, which is uh, from May 14th this year until uh, Friday, May 18th this year, the withdrawal deadline for candidacy will be the same as for all other candidates, which is May 21st is the Monday following filing week. And I would say other than that, almost all the stuff in the procedure mirrors regular election law. Once freeholders are elected, if the people decide on the proposition I refer to that they do want the freeholders to draft a charter, 
the freeholders will all be take office as equals and they'll decide for themselves how they wish to run the board of freeholders. Um, they, that, you know, that would include electing a chair if they wish and deciding how they're going to meet and when they're going to meet. That will be all for them to decide. Freeholders will be public officers of Lewis County. They will be elected officials. Um, they aren't like employees of Lewis County in the sense that they don't receive wages, benefits, uh, insurance, that sort of thing. They, uh, they will be reimbursed for their mileage in case people are driving to the meetings, but they otherwise aren't going to get a salary or other things of that nature. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that they are going to be public officers, even though they're citizen officers, if you will. Um, and that means that they will be subject to a lot of the same restrictions that other public officers are subject to, which means, that, for example, the Public Records Act, the Open Public Meetings Act, open government things in general will apply to them. The county will be eventually providing facilities to them and training to try and help them handle those duties. Uh, but that, that sort of stuff is outside the scope of what's before the commissioners today. But it is a bit of background about what a freeholder is that might be useful to anyone interested in running. Do the commissioners have any questions? Any questions from the board? Okay. We will open the question answer period for the public to ask questions. Mr. Averill. Ron Averill, a Centralia area. Eric, um, the election of the freeholders is going to take place during the general election in November, and this being a top two state, it's normally you win by majority. I, uh, there is no restriction on the number of people, I presume, that can apply. So you could have 10 or more in a given uh, sub-district that are up for election. This is pretty obvious, but I just wanted to make it clear for the public that the election is by plurality vote. So the person that gets the most, whether it's just 12 percent, is the winner. Yes, sir. And actually, just to, the, the nomination procedure reflects that in that it indicates that the, to, the top vote getter in each subdistrict shall be elected to the position corresponding to that. Yeah, I just wanted them to know that top vote getter means plurality, not majority. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I, I just wanted to clarify that. Could you say your name and where you're from? Uh, this is Chuck Honreiter here. I'm from uh, Chehalis. Uh, I just wanted to clarify now that so this won't be in the, the primary. There, is there going to be a primary this year? There, there will be no primary for freeholders. The Constitution itself provides that the election take place all at the general election. All right. And the second issue was the filing fee. Uh, I, I'm hoping you can e even lower it more. I mean, the thing of it is we're volunteers. We're not, gonna, we're not expecting to be paid a nickel for this stuff. Uh, we're helping you set up a constitution, so to speak, and and so I don't see the point of a filing fee. I mean, I know there's got to be something, I suppose, but uh, it just seems like even fifty dollars for volunteering to help government is, you know, it seems like you'd do something about that. So, okay. any other questions? Thanks, Mr. Bagwan, then. Harry Bagwan in on Alaska. So just so I'm clear, <clears throat> we're going to divide this into sub-districts, the proposal is. Um, how is that going to be reflected on the ballot for each sub-district? So I couldn't vote for a District 3 in a different sub-district than the one I currently reside in? That's correct. The, so the proposal before the commissioners is that a, a candidate from, say, um, Subdistrict 1 and District 3 would reside in that district and all the people who were registered voters who resided in that district would get to vote on that election. But none of them would be voting on, for example, District, uh, you know, Subdistrict 5 in, in Commissioner District 3. 
that each of the separate subdistrict elections would be self-contained for those residents and their candidates. So my ballot, when I receive it, will not confuse me by having a bunch of subdistricts that I'm either going to vote for. It would only have my subdistrict uh, candidates to vote from. Yes, sir. Okay. It is a trade-off in <coughs> between, it, just in terms of ballots. Having subdistricts like this makes it so that each voter gets only one subdistrict on their ballot. That does mean that there are more different types of ballots that the auditor must prepare as right. a whole to send out to all the people in the county. But each voter hopefully has a clear picture because they only get one on there, which is the one that they're living in and that all of the candidates uh, are also in. Yeah, I could see where that could get really confusing for someone trying to, to uh, campaign. Sorry, you can't vote for me. I know you're my best friend and support me, but uh, you live across the street from the subdistrict. Well, uh, how do how do the how does the public know who they are supposed to get behind until they actually get a ballot? It's just a point. I I, I don't expect you to answer that, but there's going to be some complications in running a campaign, is what I am seeing. That like, may be so. whose door do I knock on? So um, one thing that I could say to try and help people, in addition to the fact that we'll have the material available, um, is that the sub-districts were based on existing voting precincts. Um, and as best as is possible, they're designed to try and sort of reflect blocks of places that make sense to go together. So, um, for example, Packwood, Randall, and some of the area in East County Mm -hmm. are kept together. Uh, Morton, Mossy Rock, and the precincts that include them are kept together. It's not perfect because you, there, there's, you know, there are distinctions even amongst those, but as best as was possible, we tried to make it make sense for people. Yeah, I appreciate that. So I, I appreciate how hard that must have been. But um, my other question is, last question is, so average uh, size of each of the subdistricts in terms of eligible voting population? I don't know about eligible voting population, but the they are based on full population, um, which is required oh. by law. Okay, got it. Um, so I just worded that wrong. But just to answer your question for full population, the population data is based on the 2010 census, which is the best we had. Mm -hmm. And it uh, there's about 5,000 people in each of the sub-districts. Uh, each of the county commissioner districts that has five of those has about 25,000 people total. Okay, thanks, appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Eric Martin, Director of Public Works. Um, I just had a clarifying question. I've heard some questions in my office from current county employees because of a line in the resolution that says the freeholders will not be county employees. But that doesn't preclude a current county employee from running and becoming a freeholder. Is that correct, Eric? That is correct. Assuming they meet the age and residency requirements. Yes. I, I'm actually going to add one more thing on top of that, too. So, yes, a current employee of Lewis County may run for freeholder. Uh, the line that he's referring to is in the first uh, provision of the procedure, and it's meant to describe how a freeholder, once elected, doesn't automatically become an employee of Lewis County they are an independently elected official. It's not meant to say that existing employees are not allowed to run. They are allowed to run. They are allowed to run if they meet the residency requirements and they're over 18. Um, and uh, they can run even if they wish to run for some other elective office as well. Un unlike other types of positions, uh, freeholder is one of a limited number of exceptions where you are allowed to be on the ballot more than once for both freeholder and something else. So someone who wishes to run, for example, uh, assessor, uh, could also theoretically, if they wish to, run for freeholder. Um, the only limitation on that is that one is not allowed to have two conflicting offices at the same time. So the Board of County Commissioners and the Prosecutor's Office, um, they probably cannot, none of those people can run because th those offices have duties that are not the same as the freeholders, and they would probably deem to be conflicting under the law. Um, but 
it's difficult to see why someone who worked in public works, for example, would have duties in conflict with the freeholder board, and so they can't. Thanks, Eric. Yes. State your name and where you're from, please. Uh, Pete Hammer, Chehalis. Uh, two questions. Uh, when will the maps be available online, or are they already available? Oh, okay. Um, the second question I have is, um, I know in other offices people can gather signatures in order to cover the filing fee. Is that um, possible in the freeholders? Not that I care, I'll pay the fee, I have no issue, but kind of addressing Mr. Honrider's question. It, it is my belief, I haven't specifically written that into the procedure, it's my belief that they would not be able to do that in this circumstance. That unlike other elective offices, uh, the freeholder positions are special in that they, the, instead of general state law being told to provide for the filing procedure, the board is asked to supply it. The reason for that is that the freeholder election can happen at a weird time. Uh, the petition could come in only three months before the general election and it's still effective. And so the Constitution by design gives the board the right to write a, a procedure, it may not match all the rest of state law because it may not, it may need not to match it uh, because you might, for example, have missed filing week entirely. So it's my interpretation, which is not necessarily beyond everyone's difference of opinion, but it's my interpretation that that means that the general law rules and laws about how that would work don't apply and the procedure would, and this procedure doesn't allow for that. And so uh, it's my suggestion is that you can't do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Ms. Graff. Uh, Tori Graff from Centralia. Um, so other counties that have done this have expressed confusion in the ballot process between, because the fact that the vote for yes or no and the vote for the freeholders are on the same ballot. How is our ballot going to communicate that even if you vote, regardless of your position on yes or no to you, whether or not you want to proceed, you should vote for a freeholder? I don't know the answer to that question yet because uh, we haven't started the process of formulating any ballots or any materials or mailing materials that would go out with them. Um, the county auditor would have an opinion about that, I'm sure. Uh, I will be working with the board and the auditor who will be getting advice from a different prosecutor in our office. We can be working on that process. I have to say, I agree with you that it is confusing to do it that way. Um, and maybe in a perfect world we wouldn't do it that way, but unfortunately the Constitution requires it, yes. um, and so we have to. Yes. We, I mean, of course, the candidates also, if you're campaigning for freeholder, you should be telling people, yeah, you should vote for me even if you don't like the freeholder process, because then if you lose on that question, you get me, and I'm great. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that, what's happening right now is sort of the, the flip side of that, so some of the campaigning that's happening for it is basically saying only to vote for freeholders if you support the freeholder process. So I just wanted to make sure from an elections perspective that it is being, you know, see if there's any sort of guarantee that it'll be fair in terms of the way that what your choices are clearly communicated on the ballot, especially because other counties have run into that same, that same level of, uh, of confusion when it comes to the ballot. Because it's, I mean, it's, and yeah, I, I've been reading up on all the RCWs. It is very confusing that you put both of them in the same ballot and I'm just concerned that I want to make sure that everyone knows what their choices are, what their options are. That uh, that type of process in which the question of yes, do we want this or no, do we not want this is on at the same time as the yeah. people as well is not limited only to freeholders. It right. also happens with certain special districts. Mm -hmm. So perhaps um, we can look to see whether we've ever done such special districts in Lewis County and how they tried to make that known right. at those times. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Mr. Eisenberg, would you like your opening comments to be incorporated into the hearing? I would, and I also recommend that, um, that a commissioner make a motion to amend the proposal that was originally before you to conform to the tracked changes version, which uh, is under consideration that has the sub-district procedure, and that once amended, I, uh, I recommend that the board pass the amended procedure. Amend it and then pass the amendment. Okay. All right. Now we will open the hearing for public testimony. And I have one name on here. Chuck, did you want to provide Mr. any more testimony? 
Anyone else who hasn't signed up would like to make any statements to the board? All right, we will close the hearing for public testimony. Hey, I'm going to make a, a motion to amend to the direct changes. You're going to have to help me out with the language there, Eric, and repeat that. So uh, I believe that the motion that your honor wants will be the a motion to amend the procedure that's before the commission to match the track changes version, which has been published. Um, I think that's all you need. One more time. It's a motion to amend the originally published procedure to match the track changes version, which has been subsequently published. Okay, I make a motion to approve the um, changes for the for the public public changes to the tract that dress, directly reflects the new amendment. Is that? We'll probably get the language right here. Let's get the language, yes. Let's see. What is it? Make a motion to amend the original published freeholder procedure before the commissions to match the track changed version. There we go. Thank you. Second. It's been moved and seconded to amend the public version with the track version that was also published. Any comments on this particular piece? So this is amending the original with the track version. Any other comments on that? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, I make a motion to approve the, uh, the hearing to adopt nomination procedures for candidates of the Public Office of Freeholders. As amended, I'm sorry. Second. All right, it's moved and seconded to adopt the procedure as amended. Are there any comments the board members would like to make? Um, I'd just like to make one comment. I know that originally, and, I, and I, Mr. Honrad, you brought it up, uh, we originally had the fee at $100, I believe. And the rationale was, was pretty simple, that we felt like it was an investment. And again, after some deliberation and some comments, uh, someone said, suggested that maybe we reduce that from 100 to 50. And uh, I think that's where we came up with the... Uh, the the fifty dollars uh, for the candidate now again that's still fifty dollars but I think um, the other thing though it's it is an investment um, it's a very important step and if we move forward to this there's going to be a lot of responsibilities and uh, and again for for a job that's uh, going to be very very difficult without very little compensation obviously the mileage so uh, we felt or I felt personally that uh, the fifty dollars while it is a, a Substantial amount, no question about it, uh, but it was fair and equitable because we would attract candidates that were really vested in the process. So, okay. Any other comments? I'd like to make a comment that uh, the public meetings that the prosecutor's been having have been helpful to listen to some of the constituents, and the first one was in Winlock. Unfortunately, we only had four folks there. There's three prosecutors and myself and then four members of the public. So we were able to talk very, very one-to-one. -one. And when we were talking about the general like that, they are in District 2. And the thought of somebody from Winlock trying to run in all of District 2, when you consider Chehalis being, could possibly, because of name recognition, etc., could have all five of those folks be from Chehalis. It really convinced me to go into the sub-districts. And also the concern about who you vote for, et cetera, it really is incumbent on the people who are running to know who's in their district as they run their campaign. So I think uh, that's a piece. And also this map will be published so people can take a look at it. We'll be able to answer questions because we want everything to be open. Everybody can say, oh, I didn't know that. We want people to say, yes, I understand everything that you put out. 
And when I think about what Ms. Graff was talking about, you know, the confusion on the ballot, that's going to be a big education process for all of us. And we will, I know people will work in the auditor's office and the prosecutor's office to make it as, as a person could be as knowledgeable as possible from reading that ballot as to what to do and what will happen. Any other comments? Okay. It's been moved and seconded to approve resolution 18-119. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Motion carried. Thank you all who participated in this. Good of the order. Commissioners, any good of the order you'd like to share? I was going to say I was really proud of our community. Uh, last week, Little Miss Friendly's house caught on fire, and um, the people in Salkam and on Alaska and from around the county have just risen to help that family out. I think there was four, four kids and two adults, and uh, that's what our county's all about. It's helping people out when there's tragedies. Anything? Okay, we'll move to the press conference. Any members of the press have any questions? Susan? We do have a question, and it's who about the hearing. I didn't, I didn't sign. Oh, Susan DeLore with Deval Publishing. Sorry. What if no one signs up for one of the sub-districts? What if no freeholder signs up? I didn't sign up for questions. Mr. Eisenberg has the answer. Thank Good you, question. Eric Eisenberg from the prosecutor's office. Um, if no one signs up to run in a particular sub-district, then the filing period may be extended in the same manner as for all other elective offices, which is a three-day extension. Um, if still nobody were to sign up, and we would try to get the information out there that no one had filed and that maybe you should file because you're going to win because no one else has filed. Um, <laughs> but if no one files at all, the election for all the other subdistricts will proceed as normal, and then there would be a vacancy in that subdistrict. And the nomination procedure does have a method of filling vacancies. It's the same as the method, well, I don't know if it's identical, but it's very similar to the method that's used for filling sub special district vacancies in which the board um, proposes three qualified candidates to the freeholders, and then the freeholders pick from among those candidates. Right. Sure. Could, you, could you repeat what she said so we can get that on the record? Yes, she said that she had seen that in the nomination procedure there was a method of filling vacancies, and that answered her question. Eric, wasn't there also a discussion in one of the meetings that the filing week could be extended up to three days if necessary? Yes, sir. The, that's the first thing that would happen if no one filed. Okay. All right. Any other items for the press conference? I do. Uh, I'd like to encourage everyone to please be here with us on Friday for our transportation benefit <laughs> conference. Um, as many of you may know, we have uh, been to most all the city councils, town councils to talk about the possibility of expanding uh, transit to include the entire county. This conversation started uh, with Lewis Mountain Transit, which is in District 3, uh, Commissioner Stamper's district. Um, to include them so that we can continue service on the east side. It's uh, uh, quite a population over there that depends on that transit system to make three round trips a day uh, over to this area from the Packwood area and, and all points in between. And so we'll be here on uh, Friday morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, we'll be asking for a vote of the communities to move forward with uh, a ballot measure in November to expand the district. And so it's a very important meeting, very excited about it, and we hope that everyone here can be a part of that. And prior to that meeting at nine o'clock, we have the monthly mayors and commissioners meeting, and that's an open meeting. So folks, please come out and come at nine, go to the mayor's meeting, and then 10 o'clock, the transportation conference. Okay, move to adjourn. No further business, I move to adjourn. Second. Let's move to second to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Motion carried. Thank you for coming.
morning. How are you? Morning. How are you, sir? How's everyone doing? Pretty well. Yep. Yep. So, Mike's doing.